the natural world exerts some control over the growth of microbes. As scientists have learned ever more about microorganisms, we have also learned to control their growth. The development of methods to limit the growth of bacteria and protozoa in food in our bodies has been one of the most important advances in human history. Here we describe some of these methods. Here are the learning outcomes for this section of the lecture. There are many situations where we want to control the growth of bacteria. In the lab, so that experiments don't get contaminated. In our food, in water, medical situations, and in agriculture. Industries will also want to prevent bacterial growth. One of my friends used to work at a window blind manufacturer working in quality control. At one point, they were getting bubbles on their blinds during electroplanking. She suggested that bacteria were growing in their giant paint vats while they were doing the electroplating, creating gas, and that's what was causing the bubbles. They didn't believe her, and she called me. I, I listened to her and said, bring in a sample of paint. Kara brought over a sample of paint, and we painted some plates with it. Sure enough, millions of bacteria grew up on the plates. They happened to be a Pseudomonas species. By cleaning up the water they used for diluting the paint, the problem went away. Because she paid attention and remembered her microbiology class, she saved the company millions of dollars. There are a number of methods in control. I will divide them into physical methods, chemical methods, and antibiotics. There are different terms with different goals for removing microorganisms. In sterilization, all viable microorganisms, including endospores, are killed. Disinfection is the removal of a pathogens from inanimate surfaces, but it may not eliminate all microbes. Antisepsis is the removal of pathogens from living tissue. Again, it may not eliminate all microbes. Sanitation removes pathogens to a safe level, but in this case, it doesn't even maybe even remove all pathogens, just gets them down to a safe level where they don't cause disease. There are numerous physical methods for controlling microbial growth. One of the oldest and most effective is temperature. Moist heat, i.e. steam, is more effective than dry heat. Boiling kills most microbes, but not endospores. Cold temperatures can preserve food and stop growth, but refrigeration does not kill microbes. Psychrophiles, such as Listeria monocytogenes, are able to grow at these temperatures and then if they get to high enough populations can cause disease. Microbes can survive freezing. Freezing and lyophilization, which is freeze drying under a vacuum, are actually used for microbial preservation. It is necessary to add cryoprotectants in these cases to inhibit ice crystal formation, which will kill cells. When using heat to decrease the number of bacteria in a sample, four parameters need to be considered. The type of heat, moist versus dry. The time of exposure, the longer it's exposed to the heat, the temperature, the more microorganisms get killed. The temperature, the higher the temperature, the more organisms get killed. And the total population targeted. The larger the population, the longer or higher temperature you're gonna to need to use to get rid of all the organisms. Dry heat at 160 degrees centigrade for two hours or 170 degrees for one hour is very effective at killing most life forms. However, it can only be used for materials will, which will not melt at these temperatures. A common method of sterilization in laboratories is the autoclave. Autoclaves are sealed devices that use steam under pressure. They are big, carefully controlled pressure cookers. The high pressure allows water to stay liquid above 100 degrees centigrade. A temperature of 121 degrees centigrade for more than 15 minutes will kill almost all life forms. Most autoclave cycles are longer than 15 minutes due to the time it takes to reach 121 degrees centigrade and come back down safely from that temperature. Releasing the pressure too quickly after a cycle can cause liquid to boil over. 
One important point here is it is the high temperature, not the increase in pressure, that causes microorganisms to perish. Autoclaving can be a harsh process that can alter the properties of the item being treated. Pasteurization is a more moderate heat treatment method that is a popular method to control spoilage organisms in many samples. We describe the history of pasteurization in Module 1. This method heats samples to a moderate temperature to kill many microorganisms with all altering food properties. Pasteurization is not a sterilization technique. It will remove all important pathogens, including Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria, Campylobacter, Coxella, Mycobacterium, Brucella, and many others. But it still leaves behind organisms that often can spoil food. There are three popular methods of pasteurization. The original batch method consisted of heating a sample to 66 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes. Scientists discovered that raising the temperature just 6 degrees shortened the time necessary for the treatment to 15 seconds. This high temperature made way for the development of continuous methods where material passes through tubing in a heat exchanger and then rapidly cools down. In this way, large quantities of liquid can be pasteurized with a reasonably small unit. Ultra-high temperature sterilization is another method of pasteurization. Liquid is held at 140 to 150 degrees centigrade for a few seconds and results in the elimination of all microorganisms. Materials can be stored for weeks at room temperature after treatment. Consumers are still getting used to the idea of some products not needing refrigeration. While milk can be treated this way, many consumers balk at the purchase of room temperature milk. Ionizing radiation, the high energy area of the electromagnetic spectrum, i.e. gamma rays, x-rays, and UV light, is another physical method of control. All of these wavelengths will kill microorganisms by damaging DNA and proteins. UV light is the weakest and cannot penetrate deeply, therefore it is only useful in sterilizing surfaces. The food and medical industry use irradiation to control microbes. Using irradiation can decrease the shelf life of foods. This chart shows a typical dose of radiation and the subsequent shelf life of the food treated. The amount of radiation used does not alter the food chemically or change the food quality. It also does not make the food radioactive. Fish, meats, and fruits are example of food products treated with irradiation. An ancient practice for food preservation is drying. Drying reduces the water activity of the food and has been used for millennia to preserve meat. Water is made unavailable by evaporation or heating. Adding salt or sugar to a product, such as salted meats or sugar and jellies, can also reduce water activity. The other physical methods that I just described cannot treat sensitive compounds such as antibiotics or gases. In these instances, filter sterilization is an effective option. The sample passes through a material with pores in it that do not allow the bacteria to go through. There are three types of filters. Depth filters, image A, use stacks of porous material that will allow samples to pass through but cause bacteria to get caught up in them. Diatomaceous earth is an example of this type of filter. Membrane filters, B, often made of pressed cellulose fibers, are a second type. Another option is nuclear pore filters, C, where a polymer is targeted with neutrons and then exposed to a chemical that eats away at the holes made in the filter. The time of exposure in the chemical dictates the size of the pores. The time of incubation in the chemical allows for careful control of pore size and results in highly uniform size cutoffs. In the laboratory, apparati shown at right are useful in filtering solutions. For small volumes, the liquid is pulled into a syringe. A cartridge containing filter is put at the end of the syringe and the liquid is pushed through. For larger volumes, a vacuum filter apparatus is often handy. One of the best ways to demonstrate a mastery of methods of control is to know when to apply them. To give you some practice thinking about them, please answer these questions. What physical agent would you use to sterilize an empty glass flask? 
What physical agent would you use to extend the shelf life of peaches? And what physical agent would you use to add ampicillin, a heat label agent, to a medium? The correct answer to the first question is a dry heat oven. You could also use an autoclave, but that would probably not be as efficient or would be overkill. What physical agent would you do to send the shelf life as peaches? Irradiation would be the best option here. Refrigeration could do it, but irradiation would be more effective. And finally, for ampicillin, you would use filter sterilization. Many different chemicals also have antimicrobial properties and can control microbial growth. These find uses in controlling growth in food and water, on people, and in commercial enterprises. When using chemical treatments, it is crucial to consider the type of microbe, the presence of organic matter, the toxicity to non-target organisms, and the corrosiveness of the treatment. If you don't consider the microbe that you're trying to treat, you won't use the right disinfectant. Organic matter inhibits the use of these chemicals and makes them less effective. If you also have to worry about non-target organisms because you don't want to kill them, and if you use a treatment that is corrosive on a, to a surface, you then degrade the surface. In many ways, one of the goals of food preparation is not only to make the food taste good, but to also decrease its microbial load. Adding acids, pickling, of food will achieve this goal. Acids can result from the action of bacteria in the food, fermentation, or can be added. Alcohols produced by yeast can also preserve food. Sugar and salt, as mentioned earlier, will decrease the water activity. Finally, preservatives such as benzoic acid, sorbic acid, parabens, which are fatty acid esters, and spices help to inhibit microbial growth. Chemical biocides are used in medical settings, agricultural and industrial settings, including the paper industry, the textile industry, plastic manufacturer, metal and woodworking, air conditioning, electrical and nuclear power generation, petroleum mining, and others. Often they are released into the environment and that's something that needs to be considered. Chemical biocides are toxic chemicals that are non-specific for their target organism. They can be damaging to many organisms, not just microbes, and their use has to be carefully controlled. The action of these compounds is usually nonspecific in their target molecule. They will chemically modify or denature DNA, chemically modify or denature proteins, and maybe dissolve or disrupt membranes. Examples of biocides include phenolics, alcohols, aldehydes, detergents, and gases. Heavy metals and oxidizing agents are also sometimes used. I just want to briefly mention antibiotics as another method of chemical control. Antibiotics are narrow range chemicals used to selectively target one type of organism. They are produced by bacteria, fungi, or plants with most medically relevant antibiotics coming from microorganisms. We will have much more to say about them in the last module on public health. This ends our lectures on the nutrition growth and control of bacteria.